everybody. It's good to see you, everybody here in person and online. Is there anybody here who's here for the first time? Oh, wow. Welcome. My name's Daniel, Daniel West. Uh, I'm a student of Lama Yeshe Jimpa, who's the uh, spiritual director for the center, Lions Roar Dharma Center. Uh, I have a what's called a Dharma name, and my Dharma name is Yeshe Trinle, which means enlightened activity. And uh, Lama Jimpa had asked me to speak about this topic of right effort in Buddhism today, and it's my sincere hope that uh, by preparing for this talk and by uh, giving it, that I can better live up to that name. So um, besides talking to Lama Jimpa about the topic, um, my approach to preparing for this talk was essentially just to survey everything that I could find about it. You know, I looked for, you know, writings, YouTube talks, you know, anything and everything. And so it was quite varied, very spread over. Um, but my primary sources are um, a series of um, talks about right effort that were given during a right effort retreat um, by Ajahn Sona, who's a Theravadan monk. He's the abbot of the um, Birkin Forest Buddhist Monastery in British Columbia. And he gave a series of talks, like I said, of on during a retreat, multi-day retreat that was all about this subject matter. Uh, and even though I'm actually not presenting a lot of material by him, I did find um, that his description, uh, his teachings were very clear and incredibly helpful to me. And um, in fact, uh, the name of the talk, Buddhism, a religion of effort, came from a discussion where he said, you know, if Buddhism is a religion, it's a religion of effort. And uh, I found his talks to be quite inspiring. I highly recommend them. Besides that, I also uh, really um, took in a lot from uh, some YouTube talks by Tubden Chodron from Shravasti Abbey, and there were a lot of other excellent teachers. Uh, so, we're so uh, fortunate to have so many teachings available to us. And even if it might be appalling to some people, um, I also made good use of artificial intelligence discussions. <laughs> so uh, I won't be presenting much from them, uh, but they were helpful. Um, but most of all, um, uh, there's this book right here by Pema Chodron. It's called No Time to Lose, A Timely Guide to the Way of the Bodhisattva, which is a, a book or a presentation by Shanti Deva. Many people here are probably familiar with that. I got this book during a, um, there was like a book trade that was happening here a few months ago. And um, somebody left this book and it was the only one that I picked up. I was really encouraged. I saw these little, I didn't put these in here, by the way, somebody else did. <laughs> um, I was, I, I picked it up and you can, it, when I got it, the cover was really nice and was well taken care of. Um, but it's, I've had it in my backpack. I've been taking it everywhere with me. So it's a little worn, um, but I really, really enjoyed this particular book. Um, I found it very helpful. And um, when I was preparing for the talk, it was it was neat because I had all of this information from all of these sources, and I couldn't figure out how to put them all together in a fashion that made sense. Um, and then I remembered uh, something that uh, Matthew Cruz had said during one of his talks, where he said, "Ah, well, really, this is just kind of like a book report, you know, that we're doing." And so I took that to heart, and I found it helpful. And so this, this, what we're talking about today is essentially a book report on one chapter of this particular book, um, with a little bit of some addendums from other sources. Thank you for that, Matthew. Appreciate it. So in the opening prayer that we recited here today, um, the praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, it summarizes the Buddha's teachings as do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, and also when we walked into the temple, those of us who are here in person, when we walked in, there's a figure right above the door, it has like a two, two deer, and then in the middle, there's a, a wheel, I think it's called a Dharma chakra, and the wheel has eight spokes in it. And those eight spokes represent the noble eightfold path that was taught by the Buddha. And so those the, the, the aspects of that path are right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, 
right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. It's that sixth spoke, right effort. That's the one that we're talking about uh, here today. And I really enjoyed, I found this, this uh, description of right effort from the uh, Tibetan Buddhist encyclopedia that I really, really enjoyed. It says, effort is the catalyst that brings the other qualities on the path into being and then animates them. I found that particularly helpful. So the importance of effort is uh, underscored by the fact that uh, right effort is the only aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path that is also represented in the, uh, in the um, six paramitas or the perfections of the Bodhisattva. The only one, and Lama pointed this out and uh, pointed out how noteworthy that was, right? Seems pretty important if it's in both of those places. And in the uh, in the paramitas, uh, this this right effort is referred to as heroic perseverance, enthusiasm, joyful effort, and delight in virtue. So again, that's what we're talking about. But if it wasn't stressed enough how important right effort is here on this path, we have to uh, take into account the Buddha's last words, the very last thing that he told his followers. He said, all compounded things are impermanent. Work out your liberation with diligent effort. And in some cases, some reports say, he also said, be a lamp unto yourself, be a refuge to yourself. So the first part of that uh, actually just reminds us of impermanence and that it's good not to be attached to impermanent things. The other aspect of, of, of course, is, is what we're talking about today. And what that really is, is that uh, no one can really free us from suffering except for ourselves, right? We have to work towards it. We're, we're not going to meditate our way out of suffering, right? We're not going to simply read our way out of suffering. We're not going to be good people our way out of suffering. It's going to take some effort and some application of the teachings. And so it kind of reminds me of that, um, that quote or that song from Bob Marley where he sings, it says, uh, none but ourselves can free our mind, right? So it's up to us here. So uh, I thought I would start, you know, in the discussion about right effort, I thought I would start with um, not what it is, but what it's not, because that's something that I know. So I'm not actually all that, I don't really understand. I don't have a great understanding of right effort itself, but I am a highly realized master and it's opposite. So, <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> So the opposite of right effort is usually referred to as laziness. Um, but like so many other things within Buddhism, when we really begin to think about what they're talking about here, it's not you know just the superficial, what we basically understand already about laziness. And there's a quote from the Dalai Lama where he describes the three different types of laziness. He says, one can be deceived by three types of laziness of indolence, which is the wish to procrastinate, the laziness of inferiority, which is doubting your capabilities, and the laziness that is attachment to negative actions or putting great effort into non-virtue. Um, his presentation, he, he puts them in a certain order. I'm going to take them a little bit out of order, just so no one's confused about that. But indolence is really what we're just talking about normally when we say laziness. It's um, something that uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche calls a comfort orientation. Um, and I like that. He says, uh, actually, that's what all sentient beings are busy doing. They're all comfort oriented. Even the, if you see flies buzzing up and down a window, he says, you know, those flies are looking for comfort, right? And that's what most of us spend our time doing as well. Uh, thankfully, there's a, it's pretty easy to apply an antidote to laziness, um, and that is contemplating uncertainty and, I'm not uncertainty, impermanence and the certainty of death. So, you know, death is coming for us all, and we're just sort of chilling, right? Nice and comfy, no big deal. Um, Pema Chodron in the book, she likens it to the feeble comfort of a feast just before we're led to our death. And uh, Shanti Deva, who she's talking about here, he says that when we use life's pleasures to numb or distract ourselves, that we're like a buffalo lying by its butcher. 
It's good to contemplate this. I thought about actually having a little uh, death meditation uh, be part of this, but uh, we can do that on our own, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, one of the aspects of this is just considering the fact that we have this precious human birth, which is a support for our Dharma practice. And that um, we don't know how long, we know we're going to die, but we don't know how much time we have. And that it's really important to use these advan advantageous circumstances, this support while we have it. So the other type of laziness, the one that the Dalai Lama put last in that quote, um, is putting great effort into non-virtue. And so um, it's not sort of the typical way that we think of laziness because it's it's a busy form of laziness where we essentially turn our, turn our backs on the Dharma by being so busy with everything else, anything and everything except this, right? And so those pursuits are going to look different in each case, um, but what they share in common between the individuals is, is essentially putting off practice, putting off our training and not applying the teachings because we got too much other stuff to do. And uh, Shanti Deva calls this type of laziness straying to the causes of your misery because we're doing the very things that make our situation here in life quite a bit worse. Uh, and the good news, again, is there's an antidote to apply, and it's not that difficult. Uh, we simply have to see the disadvantages of cyclic existence, right? Like, sometimes we don't get what we want. Sometimes we get what we want, and it sort of satisfies us for a little bit. But then after a period of time, it stops satisfying us. That's one way to look at it. There's this, uh, there's this prayer um, by Lama Sankapa. It's called The Foundation of All Good Qualities. I like to think about that and contemplate it. And there's a there's a part in that prayer where he describes uh, this this activity, um, this being busy. He says, "Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation." Um, so the third type of laziness is essentially uh, self-contempt. It's doubt, not believing ourselves worthy or capable of pursuing this path. And this is the most like insidious and dangerous form of laziness because it stops us from even getting started in the first place. And if in fact we do find ourselves getting started, it will um, it'll cause us to stray from the path quite quickly and uh, it's difficult to come back to. So um, it's really important uh, to be on guard for that. I thought it was so important and the presentation in the book is so good that I'm, hope I'm gonna read a little bit to you from here. So. Oh. Shanti Deva uh, will discuss the third kind of laziness, the despondency of self-contempt. And is, she says, this is an important topic for Western practitioners. Freeing ourselves from confusion and suffering depends on honest self-reflection. The practice of patience, for instance, depends on honestly acknowledging our impatience and aggression. It's essential, however, that this in inquiry be based on respect and kindness for oneself. The importance of having a, a good relationship with oneself is stressed. Otherwise, the path of awakening can backfire and fuel discouragement. Seeing our kleshas and the wildness of our mind more clearly than ever before can certainly heighten feelings of guilt and self-contempt, but buying into negative thinking only slows down our spiritual journey. I'm gonna go just take it just a, a little bit further here. So um, she goes on to talk about the antidotes uh, that Shanti Deva presents for this form of laziness. We're going to cover just some of them here. So the three antidotes for self-contempt. Um, there are three ways to sort of cheer us up and to develop a compassionate relationship with ourselves. Um, so the very first one is to um, marshal our strength. That's what Shanti Deva says. And so what what. Uh, Pema Chodron uh, says here is, instead of further denigrating yourself, teach yourself the Dharma. To marshal your strength, remind yourself in whatever way is personally meaningful. 
that it's not in your best interest to reinforce thoughts and feelings of unworthiness. Even if you've already taken the bait and feel the familiar pull of self-denigration, marshal your intelligence, courage, and humor in order to turn the tide. So then um, a little bit later, she says, we can cheer ourselves up by remembering that our mind is tameable. As Trungpa Rinpoche put it, whatever occurs in the confused mind is the path. Everything is workable. It is a fearless proclamation, the lion's roar. It's like the namesake of this temple. So then there's the, the second antidote to this form of laziness is presented. Um, and that is to be the master of yourself. Again, she's borrowing language from Shanti Deva there. And this means taking responsibility for your moods. The instruction is to acknowledge that you're not a victim. Then find a way to interrupt discouragement's momentum instead of mindlessly doing what you've always done before. And then she goes on to the third one. The third suggestion is to look beyond the narrow perspective of self-centeredness at the equality of self and other. This recognition of our sameness can be cultivated by doing the practice called just like me. If you're burdened with self-contempt, remember, just like me, many others are struggling with the same state of mind. Just like me, all of them prefer comfort and ease and to be free of misery and guilt. This kind of reflection helps us to look outward and open our heart to others. Instead of armoring ourselves, the softness of empathy can set in. With this as our ground, we can practice the exchange of self and other. Now, I'm not going to go into that, but the exchange of self and other is a practice that's commonly referred to as Tong Lin. And I have two reasons that I don't want to go into it today. One of them, I don't want to just sit here and read the book to you. Uh, and the other one is because on the uh, fourth Saturday of every month, we actually have a uh, very special Tonglin practice. It's an online practice that's led by one of our Sangha members named Marie. And um, it's an extraordinarily wonderful opportunity to learn about this particular practice. And so if you're uh, challenged by self-contempt, doubt, feeling unworthy or anything like that, um, definitely get yourself over to the online Tonglin practice uh, with Marie. Okay. Let's see here. We're going to just read a little bit more. Mm. Ah, here we go. So, um, where am I? Ah, uh, so she's talking about, she, there's a couple of verses by Shanti Deva, and she says that Shanti Deva looks further into the unnecessary burden of self contempt. Seeing our confusion, it's easy to wonder how we could ever become enlightened. When we feel really low, we doubt we have any potential at all. But Shanti Deva says, don't excuse yourself with such despondency. Don't indulge in such negative thoughts when you can train in letting them go. And there's this portion in here that I found kind of interesting where Shanti Deva had said um, that the Buddhas who declared the truth had said that uh, if they bring forth strength and perseverance, the very Bees and flies and stinging gnats or grubs will find with ease enlightenment so hard to find. And so basically, you know, if stinging gnats or grubs can do it, then so can we. <laughs> All right. I think I'll probably stop right there. Otherwise, I'll finish reading the whole book too. So it's also worth noting, I was talking to Lama Jimpa um, about this particular aspect of laziness. And how sometimes, at least for me, I I felt when I read about some of the great figures in Tibetan Buddhism in particular, um, they sometimes seem sort of mythological to me. Like they're like saints, magic, you know, super strong, super big, super capable, perfect, you know, in some sense like that. And there's this recognition like, that's not me. I'm not like that at all, right? And so it feels a little, that feels a little bit discouraging. And he told me, he said, well, it's really important to note that that's more of a sort of like a linguistic or a difference in writing kind of related to the cultural traditions. And that within the traditions in which these, these teachings come from, um, or the cultures rather, where they come from, this sort of idealism is inspirational. And people take it as such. It's, it's, it's not received the way that we do because we as Westerners, we sort of, we want to know like the nitty gritty 
you know, the dark night of the soul that everybody has to go through, all the troubles and trials and how people overcome them, because that's what we find inspirational. And so I wanted to make sure that I passed that along. All right. So we have talked a little bit about what right effort is not, right? It's not laziness. So then what is it? Um, well, it is about exerting energy, um, but it's about developing that energy and uh, directing it in this like discriminating way over a period of time. And in one of the early sutras, the Buddha defined ref right effort like this. I'm just going to read this. He says, and what is right effort? One generates the desire to prevent the arising of unskillful states not yet arisen, the desire to give up unskillful states already arisen, the desire to develop skilled, skillful states not yet arisen, and the desire to nurture and further develop skillful states already arisen. One makes an effort, exerts energy, focuses, and directs the mind to these ends. So in other words, right effort is about the prevention of unwholesome states and about the promotion of wholesome states. It's essentially what, what it is. But what we're talking about here is not about being super heavy handed with ourselves, right? It's not about exerting ourselves super hard and being serious, right? It's not like that. It's not about straining and kind of like dumping out all of our energy into this. It's a joyful effort, right? Is about taking and being um, uh, being joyful in our practice, right? To find Dharma practice, like it's happy making. It's not it's not so so much of a strain on us. It's about um, being delighted by virtue. That's another another word for it, right? So um, I found this one story. Now some people here, are pro most people probably are familiar with this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. It's the uh, story of Sona Kolavisa. So this is, a, this is an old story, but Sona uh, came from a family of monks, or sorry, a, fa a wealthy family, not of monks, but he became a monk, right? Um, and he was super devotional. And at one point, the Buddha tells him, okay, gives him some instruction to go off into a secluded place in the forest to meditate. And Sona does that, he goes off into the forest and he's doing a seated meditation. But he was, I guess, a popular guy because people kept coming to see him while he was meditating. And he was distracted by this. He couldn't concentrate because all these people come, were coming to visit him. So what he decided to do was to do walking meditation instead, right? Uh, maybe they couldn't find him if he was walking away. And so he would walk barefoot up and down this path. And he put so much effort into this. It said sometimes he didn't sleep. You know, he was constantly doing this walking meditation and he developed all these sores on his feet and he kept going. And it said that he kept on going until the path itself was covered in blood, right? So you can imagine the effort he was putting into the strain that he was putting into this practice. And of course, the Buddha sort of detects this and comes to pay him a visit. And uh, the Buddha shows up and he says, uh, so Sona, back when you were a householder, didn't you know, didn't you play the uh, the lute? It's actually called a vena, but you know, didn't you play this, this stringed instrument, the vena? And Sona's like, yeah, I sure did. I was pretty good at it too. And so the Buddha says, and what do you think, Sona, when the strings of your vena were too taut, was your vena well-tuned and easy to play? And he says, nope. He says, what do you think, Sona? When the strings of your vena were too loose, was your vena well-tuned and easy to play? Nope. What do you think, Sona? When the strings of your vena were neither too taut nor too loose, but tuned to be on right pitch, was your vena well-tuned and easy to play? Yes. Yes, it sure was, he said. In the same way, Sona, the Buddha says, if effort is over-aroused, it would lead to restlessness. If effort is too slack, it would lead to laziness. Therefore, Sona, you should, de be, you should determine the right pitch for your effort, attune the pitch of your spiritual faculties to that, and there pick up your theme, or see the pattern, grasp the sign. I'm still not entirely clear on the exact meaning of that last little bit, but I could get the, the gist of it. So obviously, the key is to finding the, you know, not too tight, not too loose. We want to find that, that middle ground there. 
there's a there's a a quote here by in this book here um, by the Zen master Suzuki Roshi. He says, "What we're doing here is so important that we had better not take it too seriously." And I, I like uh, Chagyam Trungpa uh, suggested something. I I really enjoy his teachings, and one of the things that he suggested was, you know, really approaching it like an experiment. You know, to live life as an experiment. You know, just check it out, see what works, see what doesn't, and not to invest so heavily into particular outcomes. So what exactly is it, right? So we're still, there's, it's a serious thing that we're doing here, but what is it that we're doing? Well, we're preventing the causes of suffering and we're promoting the causes of happiness. And uh, the cause of suffering, according to Shanti Deva, he's going to give us uh, two particular causes of suffering. He says, bad karma and an unskillful mind. Those are the, those are two causes. So we can understand if we just spend a little bit of time trying to contemplate cause and effect, we can see that uh, something that the greatest sort of harm that we can do to ourselves is hurting other people. So it's really important to pay attention to cause and effect and, and see the, what the results are like there. Um, and uh, when it comes to an unskillful mind, I'm going to do a little bit more reading uh, from this book. Uh, 243 is the page. Go there. The second cause of our suffering is a closed, unskillful mind. This is a mind that fixates, conceptualizes, and compartmentalizes a mind incapable of seeing things without bias. We have solid ideas about self and others and equally fixed opinions about what's acceptable and unacceptable. This leads to what Shantideva calls false views. These misperceptions of reality result from tightly held notions of right and wrong. When we reify our experience, the true nature of all phenomena cannot be seen. Conversely, when our mind is free of prejudice and self-righteousness, we no longer act out of aggression and other neuroses, and our suffering abates. To the extent that the mind returns to its natural flexibility and openness, we experience freedom. With an understanding of karma and false views, even intellectually, we become more eager to loosen their destructive power. So those are the the causes of suffering, according to Shanti Deva, at least a couple of them. And he also gives us three causes for happiness. Nice and helpful. The first cause for happiness is merit, which is essentially like the fortunate outcome of our skillful actions. That's one way to look at it. It's the positive things that we get from letting go. Uh, and so uh, we definitely... Mm, these favorable circumstances come from positive actions. So it's it's good to reflect on the habitual patterns that prevent uh, um, or rather that lead to suffering. And we want to prevent those patterns. The other aspect of happiness is mental well-being, which comes from training our mind. And uh, when we train in letting go of our fixed ideas and opening ourselves up to other people, then we become much happier. And the third cause for happiness is something I'm going to read about too. She made it easy on me. I get to read. Um, so the third cause of happiness is the great joy of a bodhisattva, which is a person who's capable of entering nirvana, but who decides to stay here in samsara in order to benefit sentient beings who are suffering. Um, and I really like what was said about this. Um, let's see. 244. If you want to borrow this book from me when I'm, I'm done, you're welcome to. Fantastic. All right. So the third cause of happiness is that nothing discourages those who choose to linger in samsara for the sake of beings. How can we get seriously despondent about samsara's challenges once we've chosen to incorporate them into the path of awakening? When we're training to transform bad circumstances into the path of Bodhi, we won't get bogged down in feelings of failure as soon as something goes wrong. The Bodhisattva is constantly preparing to relate fearlessly with pain. The greater the suffering, the greater the need to go there, right into the hells of this world if need be. Thus merit ocean vast is gathered in. 
And of course, we have to be realistic because right now we can barely handle our credit card bills. But training with such everyday challenges, however, develops our courage to handle increasingly difficult situations in the future. Yeah, I like that. A um, little bit further, actually. So, Shanti Deva, uh, there's a there's a, a something that he says about this. He says, "For mounted on the horse of bodhicitta." that puts to flight all mournful weariness, who could ever be dejected, riding such a steed from joy to joy? It's a beautiful image. And Pema Chodron says, uh, she says, instead of trudging up a slippery slope in boots that hurt our feet, we're eagerly riding through this unique and precious training ground called life. I thought that was beautiful. So as we're riding this horse of bodhicitta through the training ground of life, there are what are known as the four strengths that support right effort. And uh, these four strengths are aspiration, firmness, joy, and moderation. So aspiration is this deep, deep desire to free ourselves from suffering in order to benefit other people, other beings in general. And this is something else that we did at the beginning during our opening prayers. Um, we, there's this section where we say, you know, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. And hopefully it's not just lip service, right? That's something that's a deeply felt aspiration. And that aspiration is something that is, is supportive. It supports us. And it's likened in many ways to um, like the fuel, the fuel that keeps your car going right? That aspiration is energetic. So that's, that's the first uh, strength to support right effort. The second strength um, is called firmness, but it sort of means a steadfastness, and it's based upon a commitment. So without commitment, it's really easy to give up and is, you know, to sort of give in to doubt along the way. And uh, it's said, it's, I thought this point was kind of interesting. It said, Shanti Deva says, it would be better uh, to not get started than to quit along the way. And I thought it was kind of uh, kind of funny. There's this uh, section in there where the Trungpa Rinpoche um, used this analogy of being on the operating table and then getting up halfway through the operation, right? And he says, like, you know, getting up with your guts hanging out and everything, like that's not a pretty picture. You want to stick to it, right? I thought that visual was particularly helpful for me, right? So remain committed. You got yourself into it. Now, now stay with it. <laughs> so Pema Children, she says, uh, this is why we're encouraged to sit each day. Being steadfast through emotional hurricanes as well as blue skies is an important aspect of our training. Why? because it sets up a pattern of self-compassion that's not swayed by outer circumstances or moods. And that's actually, you know, the danger in stopping halfway is because we do, we can create this particular pattern. And it's a pattern where we start something, we stop, and there's a failure, and we attribute that failure to ourselves, and we say, we can't do this, I can't do it. And that's not, that's not the case, right? So uh, we want to set up a pattern in which we will succeed all right, one more uh, reading. Actually, I'm not going to, there's going to be a multiple readings, so, but I got one more thing to say about uh, the third strength, which is joy. When we do something we don't enjoy, we drag our feet, but doing something we love, let's go swimming, let's eat popcorn and watch videos, makes us feel happy and light. Could we bring the same enthusiasm to freeing ourselves from pain? Could we approach awakening from self-absorption like those who take great pleasure in their games? With this kind of enthusiasm for challenge, life becomes a constant source of happiness. The greater the challenge, the better is the Bodhisattva's motto. And then there's this great little story in here that I think is fantastic by, uh, about Trungpa Rinpoche. So apparently his mother-in-law hated him or at least initially she couldn't stand him because she grew up in apartheid South Africa. And from her perspective, her daughter had essentially married a black man and she really didn't like that. 
And so the, she, the story says that Rinpoche was absolutely delighted by the challenge to win her over. And so what he would do is when she was the most antagonistic, he would invite her over for dinner and come over. In one case, invited her to a holiday feast. And she said, I'm not going unless he personally invites me. So he goes to her house, knocks on the door, and when she shows up, he bows down before her and he begs her, please, please come to dinner. And she begrudgingly like came to dinner. And that wasn't like the end of it. He had to keep doing that again and again, essentially courting her, right? And over time, she began to love him. And then at the end, you know, like she really had this, they had this deep connection. I love that story. <laughs> it says, the love of challenge is the bodhisattva's secret weapon. While most of us try to avoid the slightest anxiety, hint of groundlessness, or twinge of insecurity, bodhisattvas develop a healthy appetite for difficulty. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So that was related to joy. That was the third. Joy is the third strength. And then the fourth strength is moderation. And what that means is, you know, before we get started, we check our capabilities. Will we be able to do this, right? Uh, and if so, then along the way, if we discover uh, that it's more challenging than we thought, it's okay. Give ourselves a break. It's okay to rest, right? That's important to hear. Like, I think that's a critical component of this uh, that sometimes gets missed when we're talking about effort that sometimes it takes a little effort to also just take a step back, take a breather, right? You can come back to it a little bit later. So besides these, these strengths that support right effort, there are some qualities of right effort that are helpful to consider as well. Uh, first, like we were just talking about, it's not heavy handed, right? It's light. We want to be curious. We want to be playful, have a sense of humor. Uh, so, you know, we want to like, when we catch ourselves being too serious or too uptight, we want to just have a good laugh about it. It's okay. Uh, and not only that, but it's urgent. So on the one hand, it's not heavy handed, it's light, but it is important, right? It's just like the, the book says, the name of the book, no time to lose, right? Like we got to get after this. And so the combination of those two things is sort of like this lightness, this playfulness combined with this sense of urgency is particularly powerful. It's really important. Those two qualities are, um, are, are particularly important to keep in mind when we're considering our effort in practicing these or walking this path. All right. So I thought I would end with a couple of funny stories I saw here in the book. This is, these are great. This is good stuff. So these stories are about Geshe Ben, uh, who is a highly practiced uh, yogi. So once, this is about Geshe Ben catching himself, right? Which is sort of what we're talking about. So once when he was visiting some patrons, Geshe Ben saw an open bag of barley flour hanging on the wall. He needed some flour, and when he was left alone, he unconsciously started dipping in. Suddenly, realizing what he was doing, he screamed at the top of his lungs, thief, thief, I've caught a thief. When his host rushed in, there he was with his hand in the bag. And another time, I love this guy. So another time, the patrons invited all the monks for a meal. Geshe Ben was seated last. As the servers were doling out his favorite yogurt, he began to panic. What if there's none left for me? How can that fat monk take such a huge helping? As feelings of resentment grew, he began to connive how he could move ahead of the other monks before it was too late. Then he realized with remorse what he was doing and patiently waited his turn. When they finally got to him, he put his hand over his bowl and yelled, no yogurt for this greedy fellow. This yogurt addict has already had enough. <laughs> I, and I really like, I like these stories because they do a good job of illustrating right effort, right? We're, we're curious and we're mindfully watching ourselves to see if there's any uh, unskillful behavior arising. And when it, it does arise, we sort of, not sort of, we guide ourselves back. We make some correction and um, and have this sort of a, like a playful attitude, an experimental attitude about it. So I thought I'll, I'll, I'll end the talk 
part of it there. I do have another favorite story. I'm going to try to gauge. You guys down for one more story? Yeah? Okay. All right. Good. I did give you an opportunity to say no, so... All right. How, how many people here have not heard the story of Asanga and Maitreya? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is good. It's good stuff. So uh, Asanga was a, a, a Dharma student way back when, and he was a serious practitioner. Um, at one point, he wanted to meet with the uh, future Buddha, Maitreya. And so uh, he he went into a cave for a retreat practice in which he meditated, prayed, recited mantras, and visualized Maitreya in an effort to bring Maitreya to him so he could get these teachings. And um, Maitreya didn't show up. In fact, nothing happened. There wasn't any spiritual progress. Six years he was in a cave. Six years. It's a long time, right? So finally, he was like, ah, this isn't working. I'm not going to do this anymore. So he leaves the cave, gets out, starts walking down the road. And he comes across this guy who has this huge iron pole. And the guy has a silk cloth. And he's rubbing, he's rubbing the pole with the cloth. And Asanga is like, what are you doing, man? And the guy says, well, I need a needle. And I am going to wear this pole down until it becomes a needle. And Asanga is like, whoa, that's wild. But if this guy's got, you know, he's just got to take him a while, right? It might take a few million years for him to be able to get his needle, but he's got this dedication. You know, what I'm up to is even more important than that. So I can do this. He goes back into the cave. Three more years he spends on these practices. Nothing. Nothing happens. So he gets all discouraged again. and He's like, ah, I'm done. He starts walking down the road again. And he sees another man. <laughs> the man is in front of this giant, like basically like a mountain, right? A granite mountain, you can imagine. And he has a feather. And he's dipping the feather in water and rubbing the rock. <laughs> and the song is like, dude, what are you doing? This is crazy. The guy says, well, my house is over there, and this big rock, it blocks the sunlight from getting into my house. So I'm going to wear it down with the feather until the sun reaches my house. And Asanga's is like, wow, this guy, this could take him a long time. But if he can do that just to get some light into his house, man, I got to be able to continue to practice. So he goes back into the cave. Three more years he's in this cave. Praying, meditating, mantras, visualization, right? Nothing happens. Nothing, right? This is 12 years. The guy's been in the cave. Nothing's happening. So he's all discouraged again. And he leaves. And this time he doesn't see. There's no man waiting for him doing crazy things. But he's walking along. And he sees this dog. And the dog is crippled. His back legs are like broken or something. And it's like dragging itself along in its front paws. And it snarls at anybody who comes near. It's going to bite them if you, know, if you try to touch it. And Asanga is just absolutely overwhelmed. He's just like, it breaks his heart. You know, he's full of compassion for this dog. He thinks, I have to do something. Got to do something. This thing is, poor thing is suffering. But he can't get close to it because it'll bite him if he gets close. So he steps back and he's looking at the dog and he realizes the dog's it's hungry. So he surprisingly takes out a knife and he cuts off a piece of his own flesh and he throws it to the dog. And the dog eats it. And now the dog's a little bit satisfied. It's not so snarly anymore. And so uh, it lets him approach a little bit. But the, in the back of the legs, the legs are broken. It was infested. I had a bunch of like writhing maggots in the back of the legs, right? You can just picture this gross. And Asanga is like, what am I going to do? These, you know, the, obviously the dog can't be okay with these maggots in there. But if I try to pull the maggots out, I'm going to hurt them. I can't do that. I can't hurt those poor little creatures. So, so he does what any reasonable human being would do. 
<laughs> and he sticks his, he lays down like this. He gets his head down low. He sticks his tongue out, his soft tongue, right, to, to try to coax the maggots out. He, he's so kind of a little bit grossed out, right? So he closes his eyes, and he doesn't feel anything. They don't come onto his tongue, so he opens his eyes again. And what does he see? Maitreya. Maitreya's there. And, and of course, the song is like, whoa, wait a second. And now, instead of anything else, what does Asanga say? He says, where are you? I've been practicing for 12 years. 12 years I've been doing this and you never showed up. You know, what, what happened? Why now? And Maitreya says, I was there all along, but because of your obscurations, you couldn't see me. And you were able to successfully, through your initial six years of practice, you were able to wear those obscurations down a little bit so that you could see the man rubbing the pole. That was me. And then later, through more practice, you were able to see me with the big stone and the feather. And then lastly, after even more practice, you were able to clear that karmic windshield, so to speak, um, so that you could see the dog. But it wasn't until you opened your heart and with compassion extended yourself to these other beings that you truly cleared away the obscuration so that you could actually see me. I love that story. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share it. Um, that's it. That's all I've got. So if you guys have something for me, I would appreciate some comments some questions. Maybe you guys have some good stories, good book recommendations. Um, we're on? Okay. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned was the, uh, the applications of right effort, right? To what we know, what we don't know, what we're good at, what we're bad at, those things. Did you come across anything that, uh, in your readings or in your study for this that said, well, how do you actually, what's the practice to determine those things? Like what's maybe the precursor to right effort? How do you know yourself well enough to be able to know that you're doing right effort? Because that seems to be a big part of all of these uh, wonderful tidbits that you've given us is that you really need to look inside first and see what you're doing and where you're applying your effort, right? Are you applying it to video games and movies and distractions or are you applying it to something that's actually beneficial and within your capacities? How do you build your capacities? So did you see anything about maybe precursors of how to look inside yourself maybe and find those things first? Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> precursors. You know, I think one thing that I I think I remember Lama Jimpa pointing out, talking about is that oftentimes um, people are looking for some instruction around right effort in terms of how much energy to apply or where to apply and all that. And if I remember correctly, it was, it, the response was something along the lines like, there are no speed signs, no speed limit signs here. And so there isn't actually any, you won't find guidance about that, at, at least anywhere I found that where there's actual instruction, because it's so deeply personal to each and every one of us, right? And it seems that that whole idea of not too tight, not too loose, and finding that middle tune, well, what does that middle tune sound like? It's joyful, right? It's the it's the reduction of suffering, right? It's this peaceful state. And so, and what that feels like, what that experience is like, is going to be unique to each person. And so, and it varies along the way, right? So uh, sometimes there's this analogy uh, or a metaphor rather of a, of a boat, rowing a boat, you know, and that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to row, if you're going upstream, you have to row really hard right? Other times if the current's pushing you this way, you have to row over here. Other times you have to row over here. And then if you're going downstream, sometimes you can just cruise, right? Um, and so there's not, at least from what I gather, not a lot of instruction around that because it is so personal. Um, and I don't know in terms of precursors for right effort. Um, you know, I think that it's primarily, you know, looking at those four strengths, right? In particular, that aspiration. I think that that would probably be the first place to start. And I remember actually uh, Lama had given me some advice a while ago 
where I was looking, I was looking for similar an answer to that question essentially. And he said, uh, "Well, just you know, practice the Brahma Viharas, right? The that that whole may all beings um, be have happiness and the causes of happiness, so on and so forth." And I was like, "You mean just like recite that? Just keep saying that again and again and again?" And he was like, "Well, yeah, yeah, that's a fine place to start. Just do that." And so I did, and and it's interesting the way that repetition works, because eventually it begins to sort of like go from here and then down, and then you begin to have sort of that actual felt experience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was kind of struck by the I was kind of struck by the juxtaposition of joy, which most people, I'll talk to myself, a lot of people think it's like a, a 90 miles an hour. You got the you got the okay for joy, so let's just put the pedal to the metal. And, and the very next thing, moderation, which is like, okay, now pull back. And um, I just thought that was a kind of an interesting, the way they kind of, one way with this way and then pulling back and and uh let's have some wisdom about this thank you yeah um i find that interesting as well there is this sort of weaving quality right it's this finding balance not too tight not too loose yeah absolutely the joyful aspect of it is i mean it is in many cases called joyful effort it's so important to have the joyful component. If you don't actually have joy, it means likely as not you're too tight or too too loose, right? So the sound of the lute is joyful. But you could easily say, okay, my joy tonight is going to be five videos instead of two videos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the next thing says, no, 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 no. Let's go back to two videos. <laughs> I think you make a good point, actually. So, you know, I, it's a good question what the difference between, say, joy and happiness is. You know, in some cases, one way to think of happiness is it's somewhat temporary in nature. I think joyfulness has a, a deeper, longer term sort of feeling to it. And so um, it wouldn't be so impacted by temporary situations. You could be joyful and still be in a crappy situation. Interesting question, Daniel. What's the difference between your joy and your happiness? Me personally? Yes. Oh. The difference between my joy and my happiness. Um, well, I'm really happy going for long dog walks. Uh, I'm really happy hanging out with my friends and talking. I'm happy playing on the computer, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, joy, though, is, is I think the deep satisfaction that I get from my practice and seeing the results. You know, there's really something about this effort and putting it into it and seeing what comes out of it. It's it's beautiful and deeply meaningful. Um, never imagined actually uh, that I would experience anything quite like that in my life. So I'm grateful for the practice, the teachings, you know, because uh, by applying them, I've witnessed something that I really truly didn't know existed. And I think that that's the joy. Any other questions or questions on Zoom? Sue? <laughs> Last time I gave a talk, Sue made me cry. So I'm hoping that is not going to happen again. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> can, uh, Bradley, can you hear me? You have to turn the Zoom volume up. Can you hear me, Daniel? I don't know. There you go. Are we you can hear you, me? Sue. Yep. Can you hear me? Anyway, I want to say thank you. That was a wonderful talk. And um, it's more for me to think about in my use of the practice right now, which I'm using a lot of. <laughs> so thank you. Great talk. Thank Ed's you, here Sue. To say hi to. Ed wants to say hi to. There's Ed. <laughs> it's good to see both of you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. All right. Anything else? Really? Oh, someone's got their hand up there. Alton. 
Daniel, it's Ellen. I'm just channeling for Mateo. Could you please give us the name of the book again and for, for any of us that didn't catch it the first time around? Thank you, Ellen. The name of the talk is No, T I mean, the book is No Time to Lose A Timely Guide to the Way of the Bodhisattva by Pema Chodron. Did you get it? Okay, good. Arlton, do you know oh, Arlton's hand went down? Okay. All right. Oh, I see. Okay. Excellent. Really? No one's going to complain about the AI thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't find its way really into the talk so much. I did find it helpful. It's just a tool. It's true. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it's good. Well, all right. Going once, going twice. All right, we're done. Uh, let's uh, move on to closing prayers. Thank you for your talk, Daniel. It's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so dedication. Is this on? Okay. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and leave all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezim Tianzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of a flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of entire host of Maras, Sangkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Sangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Daniel, for a, a good talk. Is it on? Okay. Um, so if you want to continue this conversation or another conversation, um, Dharma Dudes is happening in just a few minutes after we get set up. So I uh, invite you to come if you've never been and check it out. And just a reminder that next Sunday we're having an Entering the Path and refuge ceremony. So um, if you have never attended Entering the Path or Refuge, please come. It's quite beautiful and um, inspiring. Um, and anybody who did not receive an email or a text from me who is Entering the Path or um, do, taking refuge, please see me afterwards or please contact Patty. Um, so that you can, uh, that I can send you some information about the, the ceremony next week. So, oh yeah, and then afterwards, after entering the path, after the whole ceremony, um, there will be a potluck. So there's generally a whole lot of people here for um, this ceremony. So um, you're encouraged to bring food for everybody. It's really, it's very fun. So thanks. Uh, in addition to refuge and entering the path, we're also celebrating Losar next Sunday. Celebrating Losar next Sunday as well. Um, and then also there's a community meeting next Saturday afternoon at 1230? 1230. So that's uh, in person. Come here to the, the Gompa for that. So good idea to know about what's going on in the community, community members, talk with Lama. So. Um, I think that's the only announcement I have. Does anyone else have announcements? No? All right. As usual, please help us uh, keep the lights on, support. There's a box in the back and a third one in the dojo.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Omo araya pasaya na ayende Om araya pasaya na ayende